Okay, hello and welcome to Stemscaping 101. We're going to take a break from doing a scene or scenes in this uh, video to do a little recap on um, color application and go into um, some different color schemes that you might uh, utilize in your um, scenic stamping. Um, I want to use a wide variety of inks and brands just so uh, you know you can kind of see the process as far as um, one that I've come to use that isn't specific to, to uh, a certain brand or consistency of ink, okay? And um, anyways, we'll try to go into uh, you know some of the art inks as well and uh, see if they won't uh, work in this uh, particular process here. Uh, Reinkers as well as pads and uh, I don't know, I, I mean I could use a um, something like a pen as well, but um, I don't know, we'll see, okay? All right, now, when I used to teach workshops, I used to always go around with these Marvy uh, Matchables. They have been discontinued. Um, you can still get them out there in the, uh, I don't know, at various uh, outlets and whatnot, but I used to use these because they're small, and they're great inks as well, but I can get, you know, I can stack these up, so if I had 24 pads, you know, with each uh, individual to use during the workshop. They can put them up. They can stack them up, you know, um, seven, eight high, and have three stacks of them, as opposed to having these pads kind of all lined up, you know, where you, can, you know, if there wasn't kind of a color coding on the side of it, and it was just easier to move along over the course of a two and a half or three hour workshop, you know, with just having things much more visual, but I've always used um, a wide variety of inks in my own home usage, you know, in addition to the, the matchables. I've always used things from Ranger and uh, I think Clear Snap and whatnot, with, uh, if they're the ones that put out the Vivids. Uh, these Memento inks uh, have been uh, really great as well, as well as I don't know, a number of other um, ink lineups uh, from various manufacturers, okay? Um, I tend to not be too uh, manufacturer specific, but it just happens to be, you know, whatever color I'm kind of looking for, and if there's one particular one, and with one manufacturer I'll get that pad. Um, okay, so that being said, uh, when I used to teach workshops, one of the things that I thought was really key in terms of uh, picking out the pads or inks that would be utilized in a scene was making things visual, okay? So if someone was going for green grass and a blue sky or something like that in their head if they were composing some kind of scene, um, what I would have them do, okay, here's some green, is make things very visual. I would have them pick out all their pads, like so, okay? And I would have them try to do this exercise of just focusing on the values of it mean lining them up from what they thought was probably the lightest color uh, to the darkest, okay? So if this, you know, if these were the greens that were in their uh, pad lineup, then that they would do something similar to this. If they couldn't tell which one was darker than the other, okay? I would always tell them, eh, which is true, but it just doesn't matter, okay? Now let's say we don't have these five pads, and let's say we only have these three colors right here. It's really easy to tell that this is light, medium, and dark, okay? It's lighter, you know, darker, darkest, okay? So I would have them do that, and because it just seemed easier, when we start on the process here, you'll see us layering down light tones and working into the darker tones. If someone does that, you can see that the jump, you know, in terms of the value goes from something that's fairly light to something that's a lot darker, okay? Now that jump can be made, but when you're applying this ink on top of that, you know, that color or that value on top of that value, you can see that it's just going to be a little bit more of a potentially precarious um, process there because that color just shows up so much darker on top of that, and we don't want to have these you know, with whatever 
you know, type of applicator you use. You don't want to have, you know, the applicator shape so obvious on the previous layering over the previous color. So if you work through those transitions and work through your medium tones or whatnot to get to the darker tones, it just made the process a little bit easier for people, especially if you're kind of getting used to this layering process right here. And as the result of utilizing those, um, medium tones, you know, to get to the darker tones. The scene just becomes richer as a result because even though you're putting these colors over the top of the previous ones, the colors underneath as the base coats or as the first initial layers, even if they are coated or, uh, co you know, coated over with another color, dye base stinks are transparent, so it's like putting these glazes over one another and it just becomes richer as a result when you see the end result, okay? Okay, so going back to that color scheme, let's take out a few of these tones. I know you're saying, well, hey, you just said utilize, you know, uh, you know, those medium tones, but what I'm getting at here is let's take out some colors, um, because inevitably what you probably have at home is, you know, maybe you don't have a full range of every hue out there, you know, light blue, medium blue, darker blue, you know, light green, medium green, darker green in one particular lineup. So here's a distress ink right here. Now, if that, um, kind of that color, uh, coating as far as that, uh, printed, uh, sticker goes is accurate, I would probably place that somewhere, you know, maybe in between these two colors, perhaps. All right. And let's try this memento. This is a cottage ivy right there. Maybe that would be, you know, similar to this green right here in terms of value. I don't know. But if they're not too far off one from one another, it just doesn't matter. I mean, I can put this one before the screen or after it. It's not going to matter in the end, okay? You know, what happens to be very obvious is something like this jump, okay? So, that being said, that's going to be the lineup right here, all right? But, okay, now, um, one thing that I always go into on these videos is I always mention the importance of that base layer being kind of... Um, somewhat of a thicker style of ink. Okay, now the Ranger ones, you know, the ones that we've been utilizing a lot are the Adirondack Light colors, okay? Adirondack Light are the new names for um, the seashell lineup that they used to have. Uh, seashell, this is Peach Bellini. Uh, it's now called Adirondack Light. It's Peach Bellini, but the lemonade used to be uh, conch shell, okay? So, all right. Now, let me see. There's an Adirondack light, well, here, we have one. It's called seagrass, okay? Now, if you have any of the Adirondack lights, they're probably going to be some of the lighter tones, lighter values of any ink uh, line that you have, because these are shadow stamping inks, okay? They were, I think they were conceived to be like shadows, so if you stamp something out, in a given color, you can, you know, clean it off, ink it up at the, with one of the seashells at Ronaldic Lights, and kind of, you know, do it a little bit off center again, stamp it down, and it's going to look like a shadow is being cast by um, whatever image or word yet you've used. Okay, so very light values. Okay, now, like, I, I, I'm not going to be stamping some scene here. We just want to apply some inks down. Okay. Now, I've lightened up my, um, uh, exposure compensation on my camera right here that, uh, so that it, uh, brightens up the scene and, uh, so you can see it a little bit better. But one thing I noticed when I did that on my last video, I thought with the Adirondack lights, um, in filming this, you can, oh, I'm not even sure if you can see anything that's happening right there, but that's because this is, again, it's a very, very light ink, okay? And there's just a hint of this greenish hue on here. Yeah, I, I think you can make it out a little bit. See, it's just a little bit darker there and lighter down here. That's where I've applied the ink. Okay, now going back to this base coat ink, just a side thing, you know, in terms of the color um, scheme. 
you don't want to just color, okay? You want to get a pretty thick layer. This happens to be glossy cardstock, okay? You want to get a pretty thick layer of that down, okay? You don't want to just color it. You want to get, I don't know, kind of an almost a... It is penetrating the paper, and it's not super wet to the touch if I touched it right now. But it's kind of penetrating through the glossy uh, coating a little bit. And it's moistening the pulp of the paper. And what happens is when I go on with other brands of inks, I don't have to worry about um, getting really super definitive shapes with my applicator because the page right here is going to be coated a little bit. All right? So what that's going to look like, let's just jump to this color right here, okay? See that little shape right there? It gives me time to blend it out, okay? That's the importance of that base coat. If I just do it over here on this side, okay, now I do have some of that Adirondack light in here, but... Okay, there was too much. Let me, let me go with a, uh, a dry uh, applicator right here and just go straight on with that. Marvy ink. The Marvy inks are a little bit thinner, okay? So I've laid that down, and you can see here, see how that doesn't really spread out well? Now, I would never use this type of application, boom, you know, with a super hard touch on it, you know, where it doesn't blend out. Now that one blended out okay. Well, actually, I had some of that uh, seashell ink right here. But if I go back over here and do that same type of thing, it spreads around beautifully, okay? So it takes out a lot of the, uh, I don't know, um, I, I, I wouldn't call it a precarious nature or something like that of the uh, the process here, but it, it it's really the, I don't know, kind of the great equalizer in terms of the different consistencies of inks that are out there. You know, you just never have to worry about it uh, in terms of blending things together, okay? The inks will blend a lot easier if they're kind of a little bit moist on top of the paper as opposed to penetrating the pulp of the paper deep down and leaving that really definitive mark on there, okay? All right, let's see, I've kind of blended that out really nicely over the top, but let's go back to our color scheme, okay? Let's speed this up a little bit, okay? I'm gonna go with some lemonade. That's a really light value of um, yellow and of course, Green relates to yellow because without yellow there'd be no green, okay? Just going back to the basics of color blending, yellow and blue make green, okay? So we can use this as a base coat as well, all right? So let's say that um, I'm doing some kind of grass scene again, all right? I wouldn't necessarily do everything all the same um, value. And something like this, you want to have things oscillate between light and dark through there, because that's what you would probably see in nature, okay, even down here in something like this. There's a lighter area in there, it brings the focus to certain areas, and that's when you see, you know, I mean, lighting, looking across the landscape, all right, even at high noon, you know, when kind of the shadows are being kind of, you know, the colors and values are being kind of washed out, you know, the intensity, chances are over the you know, over, uh, you know, a certain area, you're going to see some shadows and highlights here and there, okay? All right, now that's all been coated with uh, that lemonade, kind of a yellow, and again, there was some of that uh, um, seagrass, okay? Uh, let's go back to this one. This one right here is a Marvy 52 yellow, okay? One of the things that I do too sometimes is if I have to, after I get that base coat down, what I do is I form a little bit of a puddle light like that. Those aren't impressions, they're kind of sitting on the surface. And then I blend that out, okay? Because it's kind of like pulling a puddle of ink across there. And it makes the blending process kind of nice and smooth, okay? Do that. Pull it across. You have to know your paper though, all right? You can try that, and if you're getting too much of a definitive shape, and you go like this, and oh my gosh, you know, that shape is still sitting there. Um, chances are you either need two things. You need to um, put more of that base coat down, go back, 
and put more of that base coat down of that lighter ink or a thicker ink, okay, whatever brand it is, and then go on over the top of it again um, and uh, see if it spreads out for you. Or if you're getting too definitive of a shape of something like that, if you're trying this kind of this puddling method where you're squeezing out some of that ink and pulling it on there, if it's leaving a shape, then just don't do it that way. Instead, just apply down and pull across, okay? And I say this in other videos too, but um, you don't always have to work, you know, with your seam facing upright like that, okay? And pulling it this way and this way and this way and this way. Okay, turn the card and uh, apply the inks in more of an ergonomic method. Your hand naturally goes like this, okay? It doesn't go like this, all right? I mean, if you have to do a couple little things here and there, that's not really going to be a big deal. But if you're doing vast areas, you know, uh, make it comfortable for your hand, you know, when you get into these repetitive mo movements like that. It can cause fatigue, and I, I think just things don't look as graceful when you're kind of using your hands in a, in a motion, you know, which isn't natural to them, okay? So it's just as easy just to switch your card around, all right? Okay, let's move into this peeled paint right here. And let's see what color. Okay, now I'm going to take off some of this ink right here. And uh, let me test it out right here. It looks kind of like an olive uh, color to me. All right. Uh, I really love these kind of more olive, these kind of muted tones of green when I'm using it in grass. If I just do something like, uh, if, I, if I'm going to do grass in a scene, tend to not like just something like this. Um, to me, uh, I mean, I can see it right here. This looks like it's going to be a really super hot, uh, I don't know, like a day glow feel the grass or something like that. So I like these more muted tones in there. Okay, I like the intensity, you know, that something like this will provide, and we'll utilize it on here, but um, um, sometimes you have to go in and use um, some color that's going to kind of tone down the intensity of a given hue. Um, so you get the richness of it, but not the, I don't know, the hot vibrancy of it, okay? All right, Peel paint. Let's try this one. Let's throw this into the mix. This is Memento Bamboo Leaves. Let's test that out. It's a little bit more of just a straight green. Remember, I do have the peeled paint in there. I'm not bothering to clean this off in between colors. I don't feel it's polluting the previous pad that I used to, to just stamp it in there because I've already wiped off a lot of this. Um, tone ink onto my cardstock, and if I'm working from light colors and going to the darker tone, I don't need to worry about that so much, okay? Now, if this is super, super wet still, maybe I don't take it into another color, all right? Maybe I dab it off a couple times, but I don't really need to wash that uh, tip off or switch tips, okay? So you can see what's kind of coming around now. Now, I, I do want to go through some other color schemes, so let's kind of speed this up, all right? Let's jump into our darker tones. Let's, okay, let's utilize this. Oh, this one's a medium tone, okay? This is that really super vibrant green. It's this color green right here, all right? Uh, it's a little bit darker, because like I said, I have those other colors still in there, but, all right? See this applied over the top of that kind of more brownish olive green. Um, it looks a little bit more muted. All right, very vibrant right now. Pull the cross. Uh, it becomes kind of softer. It's a softer transition. It's not so super super bright. I'll show you what color this is right here. It's that. You see that color over the top of this and dragged? It doesn't look like that color, does it? All right? It's just a little bit. 
you're getting the benefits of some of this, you know, the glow of it without the super bright hotness of it. Okay. Now, I mean, some of you might be saying, hey, but I like this color right there. All right. Well, then, you know, don't use something like the peeled paint, you know, in there. Okay, let's go with this green here. Uh, this is a Marvy green. It's just called green. It's the number four. Okay. All right. Let's not do this all over the entire page. Let's just do this one corner here because I want to move on. Green is getting a little bit too hot for me. Let's try the Cottage Ivy here. It's a memento. All right, let's take some of this off. I have too much of that previous green in there. Okay. Okay. Okay, now unless we're doing something like grass that's supposed to be uh, like an astroturf or something, Let's go into some darker tones or some different tones, okay? Imagine this is, you know, this grass area like that. Okay, it's similar to this one right here, um, in a way. This one gets a little bit darker, though, because I brought in some different blues here, you know, so it kind of matches the sky a little bit more. But let's go into a bottle green, okay? So like I said, we've worked across manufacturers, uh, they're all dye-based inks though, you know, in this process right here. Okay, there's your greens, you know, you can just imagine some grass textures down there or something of that sort. Um, okay, that was the Adirondack bottle, looks like a slightly bluish green to me. Let's try something if I have it. Um, I'm trying to see if I had a green. There's gold olive. No idea what it's going to look like. This is a Luma art dye just for the sake of experimentation. Uh, you can do this with your um, craft ink reading cruise as well, okay? Let's say we don't have a medium tone green. Let's say we don't have any of these, okay? Let's say all I have is a yellow green and this cottage ivy right here, something like similar to this in terms of a dark green, okay? It's doable, but if I have a re-inker for either one of these, okay? I could put it a little drop down there and something like this. Okay, no, here. I actually have this. This is um, the... Uh, I'm trying to remember. This was lemonade that I used on this card, okay? Um, all right. Here's an ocean aqua. Um, oh, here, here, here we go. Let's do this. This is a bottle green. It's a super dark green from Marvy. And let's say I had the re-inkers for these, or if I had the inkers for one of these, okay? Kong shell or the bottle green. You can always, um, I got some ink on my finger there from one of these bottles. re -ink oh, there it is. It's all pouring off the side. Probably went to a convention somewhere and got shipped back by air and spelled out the side, okay? Uh, I'm going to mix these two right here, okay? Let's go with a little bit of that bottle green. Oh, here, you probably want to see this. Let me show you the bottle green um, just by itself. Okay. All right. It's pretty dark, right? Okay. So let's add that lemonade, okay, that, well, now we're really totally mixing uh, companies right here. Uh, okay, that bottle green really overpowers that. Let's add a little bit more of that lemonade then, okay. Okay, so let's 
see, that's, uh, I mean, this is just about as light as you can go in terms of contrast. You have that lemonade and bottle green. Bottle green was just about one of the darker greens in the Marvy line. And of course, the uh, Adirondack Lights lemonade is one of the lightest yellows, right? So, it's a little bit of a different hue right here, okay? See that right there? It's a little bit more of a, I'm uh, getting a moire effect here. Um, See that right there? And this is a full saturation now, okay? Now let's take out more of this ink right here, okay? One thing I'm learning right now, this is the first time I've done this, but I really want people to kind of, you know, make use of what you have in terms of experimentation. And uh, this is what I'm finding right here. You need a lot <laughs> less of the darker tone and a lot more of the lighter tone to get these transitions right here, okay? But it's, and this is just a little drop of this ink too. I mean, this re-inker will re-inker pad just, I don't know, maybe it's safe to say like a, you know, a dozen or two times over, okay? So it's not really utilizing a whole lot of ink either. And this pad right here is really saturated, okay? But here comes this yellow right here and uh, The, uh, the bottle green, okay? So you can see you can get plenty of transitions, okay? Working through here with the use of uh, kind of the merging of uh, hue and value, okay? All right? Let's use it on here and see what it looks like, okay? All right, now, one of the things about grassy areas, and uh, if you see grass in any one of my videos or scenes or lessons in the videos, of course, you can see it being applied, but I don't like that super green hue in terms of my grass. So one of my things that I like to do is I like to go back in with something like a brown, kind of like a medium tone brown, you can start off with a lighter one. A lighter brown would be something like a tan, right? You know, in terms of light, medium, and dark, uh, going through a range again, all right? So, let's see. I don't think this pale orange is going to show up on this scene, and it really doesn't, yeah, it might mute it down a little bit, getting a little bit of that warmth. Let's go to this brown here, though, and bring it, ooh, that's way too brown, okay, but let's apply it down anyway, okay. It's because I didn't use a lot of the green up there, but this is the color that's used right here. Can you see those little brown tone in there? You can definitely see it back there where the sky is kind of brown. It transitions into the here. See that area back in there? That's really brown over green. And down here too. All right. It kind of mellows things out a little bit. All right. Okay, let's go back to some of that darker green. Let's just go straight into our reinker fluid since we already have that down there. No use wasting it, okay? And just apply it down like so, okay? I'm starting to get fingerprints all over this uh, card. Okay. Anyways, that is that tone of green. I'd probably go darker out here too, but just for the sake of showing those transitions, that right here is basically this, okay? Now where it differs from this one, see, this is what I like to do too. The colors of the sky here are blue, transitions of blue, and I like to bring those sky colors down into there you know, the grassy areas, or whatever colors are down here, okay? 
because I like to make a relationship between different areas, even if I undergo a, a huge change. Okay, so it's green down here and blue up here. Green grass, blue sky. But I bring more of those blues down into the grass as a result. In this scene right here, we have kind of a tan, warm, brown sky, right? So those same browns are down in the grass down here. Okay, so I figured, you know, it's kind of a warm, brownish tone light and it's casting that light. That light is shining down on all of these elements down here, the blades of grass or whatnot. And I want them to reflect back some of that hue. All right, so as a result, we have some of that brown there. If I only have green down here and those colors up there, I feel the scene looks a little bit fragmented and the scene doesn't look quite as cohesive, okay? Uh, now here's another couple examples of uh, these green tones, okay? The, these are... Uh, they, I think these are both lessons. I'm trying to think if this one was a lesson or not. I've already kind of forgotten. But anyways, uh, moon in the floors. Floor, brown, you know, tree stumps. And I bring brown into those areas right over here. Believe it or not, it's really similar to this. Now, this one right here utilizes a lot more of the darker greens, kind of um, in this range right here, but it's basically, you can kind of see that brown in there a little bit. And again, it's a blue sky, so I bring some of these blues down in these areas like that, like in the shadows, it's a perfect opportunity for them. See that? It's basically green down here, but you get those blues. You even have the blue in the tree trunk right there, right? All right. But when I look at this scene right here, I don't think people are saying, wait a minute, you know, that blue grass right there doesn't make sense or something like that. I think it, you know, it kind of harmonizes. It brings things in there. You have brown mushrooms, brown tree stumps right here. You have a little brown up in that sky, right? It's not just pure blue, like something like that, right? Uh, I'm gonna compare contrast all blue up here and down here, right? It doesn't look like that up there, does it? Okay, it's a little bit uh, more mellow. You get a little bit of warmth, you know, kind of up there. And it's because I have some of those tones down here. So you bring a little bit of this into here and a little bit of this up there. And it doesn't have to be real, you know, right. It's not that color brown up here. You know, it's just a real faint, uh, shade of it. Okay, very light uh, tones up here in terms of the blue, okay, but uh, you know, brownish tones down here. It's not just these colors now, all right? In here I've brought a lot more of the yellows and ochres and whatnot over the top of this base palette right here, okay? But you do still get some you know, darker tones of green. That green right over here is probably, see right here, right? I mean, this looks really funny, uh, if not ugly, right? But if you show it in context, that right there, I mean, it's basically that right there, right? Okay, so there's the brown over the greens, right? So that's where you have that transition right there. Okay, so, that being said, oh, uh, here's some just pure greens without the brown. This one was the uh, kind of the Northern Lights uh, scene that I did. But that's just utilizing some some light. Uh, let's show it uh, on this. Now, I don't know exactly what colors I used on here, but I'm guessing that it was probably uh, something like this which is the same thing that we used in this, all right, okay. But, I don't know, uh, don't go back in this scene and say, hey, you didn't use that number 11 green or something like that, okay? Um, not too important. Like I said, I just use, you know, utilize what you have, you know. Uh, most people, the one things that people sometimes won't have, they won't have those um, super light values of the uh, 
um, shadow stampings, but most of the times people have a pretty good, you know, collection of uh, inks, especially dye-based inks. I don't know, I know some people only have pigment inks or something like that, but uh, usually, you, you know, you can put together a good range of tones uh, just by mixing and matching or using a little bit less of one color and a little bit more of another, kind of like in that mixing method. Okay, um, let's go to a, just a couple other color schemes really fast. Um, let's do the Ocean Aqua. Okay, let's speed things up around here. Uh, um, not Ocean Aqua color scheme, but the uh, a bluish color scheme, okay? And then we'll go into some transitions. Okay, light, medium, dark. Let's take this out of the mix. Let's say we don't have it. Let's use the memento, dark blue. It looks to be of a similar value if the color coding is uh, accurate. This one might be a little bit darker, okay? But let's test it out. Okay, starting off with the very lightest tone. Again, the lightest tones are, you know, in other words, called the, what I'm doing is a base code. It's the base of all the other colors to come, okay? Let's say I'm doing some kind of sky. And this scene right here, it was the sky, night sky, and, uh, you know, the snowy area. Uh, that's a barn from, I forgot what company it is. It's on our website. Really cool barn. And it comes with that uh, uh, windmill on the side. Okay, you can see that the ink is beading on the surface right there, and that's how you can tell it's kind of a glossy cardstock. Glossy cardstocks are different than photo paper, okay? Um, glossy cardstocks that I'm using are more of a, an offset brand of printing paper as opposed to a home inkjet or laser paper. And that's the type of paper that you're gonna be buying if you buy cardstock at a stamp store or something like that. Most likely, you'll be buying kind of professional printing paper, okay? Uh, then something like, uh, you know, like I said, you know, from like a home printing paper. Okay, this is salvia blue. It's a good light blue. Let's try the uh, light blue from Marvy. Again, number 10. And if you don't have that, then... Oh, I don't know. Let me see. Here's a Memento Summer Sky. It looks very similar to uh, the Salvia blue, right? You can mix and match again. Consistency is different from this ink to this ink. But the hue and value are, they look to be very similar. And remember that re-inkers can be used not just for the re-inking of a pad, but you can use it to mix your own colors, mix your own values, mix a ocean aqua with a lemonade, and what color would you get? You'd get a light blue of some sort, right? Ocean aqua is now called aqua in the Adirondack Lights uh, range of uh, colors. Um, oh, I just saw something. This is a memento but Bahama Blue. Let's give that a shot. Looks really similar to the light blue from Marvy, right? Probably have to start utilizing some, well, not me, because I have a ton of re-inkers for all these things right here, but uh, like I said, Marvy has been discon, you know, Marvy's, at least Uchida of America has discontinued the, uh, ordering the, uh, the Marvy line. Yeah, very similar. So Memento Blue, oh, Memento Bahama Blue. Utilize it for your number 10 Marvy. If you don't have the pad or 
you don't have a reinker for it or something like that. It looks uh, like a perfectly good replacement. But, okay. Like I said before, if you don't have this too, try something else. Try mixing, uh, you know, a darker blue reinker with a lighter blue one or whatnot. Um, you wouldn't be you you wouldn't be mixing something like a uh, a pigment ink though and a dye based ink, okay? There's always going to be some guy out there that's going to do that. Just say, hey, you know, you said not to do that, and look at it worked or something like that. But as far as this process goes, you want these inks to set up on the paper, so, <clears throat> you know, if you put a big slathering of pigment ink down there on glossy cardstock, um, I don't know, it'll probably dry, but you might have to wait for, a, you know, like a year or something like that for it to do so. Okay, this is the uh, Danube Blue, pretty good one for the sides. Okay, now you have something like this. Now I could go into darker tones, okay? But I want to twist this a little bit, okay? Let's say I wanted to go into something like... Oh, uh, you're thinking about the Caribbean... I don't know. You know, wherever you get kind of a blue-greenish tone of uh, water. You want to find warm water of very welcoming water or something like that, as opposed to a chilly-looking water. We can kind of warm things up by utilizing some greens in there. Am I going to use like a pine green or a dark green or something like this when I add another hue? You could. My preference is to go light to test it out. See if you like that new hue that you're not necessarily mixing to form because this green isn't mixing with the blues down there, but you're applying it over it like a clear um, pane of glass or whatever, you know, and the light shining through it. So those colors underneath are, you know, you're not going to get that color of green, right? You're going to get that color of blue, all right? So it's more of a aqua toned green, turquoise, you might say. And I think I had, so, okay, here. That's this scene right here, okay? I've colored my leaves and pine trees kind of green there. And what you get is this, uh, this greenish transitions in the blue, okay? Something like that. And going back to further blending, um, Let's look at something like, I don't know, I didn't plan this out well. I just grabbed some previous scenes. Okay, this is more of a purplish toned uh, composition, of course. You see these pinks. Look at the blue up there. Do you see this blue right here? It's the same as that blue mixed into the uh, uh, Alto Keemless cloud. But just to show you that, um, Switch out this tip right here and put on this new tip. Um, let's show you what some uh, pink transitions will look like, okay? Pink over the top of blue make what? Purple, right? Violet. Here you get that little glow of violets and pink right there. See, I've left some of that white of the paper, so it's not all purple. It's the pure pink right there, and we get this transition. Okay, now I think I have something. Didn't I? Uh, eh, kind of a little bit. All right, the purple, the pink is in the mountain there. All right, here you get those greens down here with a little round. But see how I put some of that pink down here in the green to reflect that light pink on top of the uh, covered bridge. Okay. So here we have, you know, uh, kind of a similar color scheme going on up there. Darker in the edge corners, because I've gone into a couple other colors, but uh, for the most part, it's uh, somewhat similar. I'm talking about the top of this, not the bottom of this. Okay. So anyways, that is that. Um, let's go into one more color scheme. Let's look at reds or something like that, thinking about some kind of sunset. All right. Here's transitions going from 
something fairly light into something darker, okay? Does that look like a sunset to you? Probably not, it doesn't look like it to me. So we can utilize some yellows through there. But just, let's just say, for the sake of this video, let's just go into, oh, here's a red right here from Fire Brick Red. Okay, let's utilize that into the, uh, the process. Okay, mm, let's go on with a, let's see, let's utilize a peach bellini as my base coat, okay? It's kind of like a pale orange, I guess you can say. This is a number 67 bubblegum pink. I don't know if you can tell from this video, I didn't put... Now I have some of this peach bellini in this pad right here, but, uh, you know, because I didn't clean it off afterwards, but um, I have some of this peach bellini up here and down here, it's just pure base paper, but you can see the difference in tone. It's a little bit more pink down here, a little bit warmer pink up there. Okay, this is a Rose Marie. A little bit of a brighter pink, isn't it? out. Let's test out this fired brick. Let's see what this looks like. Pretty nice. A little bit of a warm red to me. Let's go into the plum, okay? Maybe think of this as like your crimson sky uh, color scheme. Okay, that's those, that selection of hue and what it looks like. Uh, it looks okay, but to me, my eyes kind of wanting something else, different, uh, something further. All right, let's, I know, I didn't plan this out, but let's use this walnut stain here. I think that going back into kind of a brownish tone can potentially, you know, add an element of uh, richness to it. I don't want some things to be so bright red sometimes, just like I don't want things to be so green sometimes in a scene, okay? I want some areas of that pure red, maybe, but let's just kind of tone this out on the outside edge with this walnut stain. It looks a little bit more uh, rich, but maybe not quite as hot as it did with a very bright red. Um, where's my brown again? Oh, here it is right here. Let's use that one. Okay. Spirit of it is changing, isn't it? You know, just by adding on another layer. The red has not been completely obliterated. It's showing through the brown. Okay. Remember that brown is not just this pure brown like that, right? It looks different right here, right? Eh, 
and let's go to a dark brown on the corners, okay? Okay, does that look like a sunset or sunrise to you? Uh, perhaps, but to me, I like I want a little bit more warmth in there. Let's go back to our reinker lemonade. Uh, if you get reinkers in kind of blue, yellow, and red, what are those? You know, they're the primary colors, right? And in theory, you can mix and achieve a lot of other colors with just the primaries, okay? Okay, let's warm this up a little bit with this uh, yellow, okay? Do it right over the top. I'll do it over half and you can see what it looks like, okay? Okay, there it is. See that right up there? See how warm that is? And this like down here looks a little bit more temperature-less, doesn't it? Okay, so there you have it in terms of that. Now I could go darker. You could add some purples or something like that if you want to transition in off into some purples. Or you can go into some darker browns and it would make for a great little sunset or sunrise, I would think. Very intense one. And I don't know if I, have, I don't think I have a sample of that right here. I don't. But anyways, that's an example of that. Transition it off further. Do whatever you want. Go with the four corners. Oh, this brown right here. Let's try that one. This is a memento rich cocoa. Looks pretty good. On the corners right there. Kind of frame things off a bit. And there you have a background sunset. Um, uh, let me see. This is something that I did on my previous video with the lakeside cabin. Let's uh, let's take a look at that. Let's see if I have my black pad somewhere here. If I don't, if I don't have it, I won't. Where did my black pad go? It's probably sitting right in front of my face. I can't see it. Huh. Well, I don't know. Oh, here we go. Okay, let's see what this will look like. No, I mean, I'm not going to do a full composition, but just for an example of, uh, you know, utilizing something uh, in terms of a scene uh, for this background, okay? Okay. Now, I mean, that's not a complete scene. I would add some shadows down here or something like that, but you can see what that uh, background might look like with uh, some subject matter in the foreground. Okay. But anyways, to recap, you know, work through a transition of uh, values, you know, for the, I think, for the easiest uh, process of transitioning and to achieve the best results as far as getting a, a rich and vibrant, deep surface in there. Now, these ones haven't even been sprayed. If I spray them, they'll get even more vibrant and whatnot, so... But anyways, you can get those nice transitions in there. You don't see a lot of shapes of your applicator. Things blend very nicely if you get a good base coat down. And mixing and matching, you know, utilize what you have um, in your repertoire. You know, you, when you utilize things that you have, then you kind of comes, you know, things will come to mind uh, in a much clearer fashion as far as um, things that you need to supplement if you do need to expand your uh, ink collection, you know, maybe getting middle tone values or lighter tone values, okay, that you might not have used before, you know, to utilize in the base coats. I think that if I was to get uh, a whole set of pads again, I would concentrate mostly with my 
you know, light tones and medium tones for the most part, because I blend a lot of those together and they form slightly darker tones to begin with. And then when I get into those darkest tones quite often, they're just kind of used on the perimeters, okay? My pads that I hardly ever need to re-ink are my darkest tones because I utilize those lightest ones across the whole page, but the darker ones tends to be on the uh, corners of the page and they don't penetrate the surface as much because my pages are already wet, so it's not getting sucked into the pulp of the paper, which is already kind of saturated uh, quite a bit with the lighter tones. So these darker tones might go in here quite a bit, but it's not sitting again in the pulp of the paper. Okay, so anyways, I hope that uh, kind of uh, goes into um, color applications and color choices uh, uh, in a kind of a understandable uh, method as far as um, your utilization of them and uh, this particular process right here, okay? If you have any questions, go ahead and drop us an email or write it into the uh, comment section, okay? Thanks for watching.